Good evening. I'll talk to you today about my life in the Indian Foreign Service as a diplomat and give you some sense of what a life in diplomacy uh, means and what kind of uh, options uh, in terms of uh, one's uh, uh, career, one's uh, lifestyle, and most of all, one's own intellectual uh, interests uh, life as a diplomat uh, presents. Uh, I joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1982 uh, and uh, in um, the middle of 1983 found myself posted uh, to Kuwait in the, uh, in the Gulf. It was not a posting I had expected, but I spent the next three years there and these formed in some ways my introduction to a life in diplomacy. Kuwait remained, has remained in many ways, uh, my most difficult uh, posting. First of all, I was uh, new to living uh, abroad. And secondly, the country offered certain uh, difficulties, which were possibly uh, in many ways special uh, to it. I found Kuwait to be a, it's a city state. And I found it to be uh, made up of a number of self-contained compartments consisting of the original Kuwaitis, many of whom were uh, uh, descendants of uh, tribes who had lived in that part of the Gulf for many uh, generations. Uh, there were a large number of uh, different expatriates, different nationalities, a significant number of people from uh, South Asia, including India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, etc. But different national groups were really uh, almost, in a sense, in different islands. And you found, at least I found, that unless one made the effort, it was easy to live uh, for three years in Kuwait and find yourself having spent that time in a largely Indian or quasi-Indian environment. Fortunately, uh, Kuwait was also the place where I was supposed to learn Arabic and I was uh, therefore required to spend some amount of time in uh, the Kuwait University learning the language. And because of that exposure, I was able to make friends uh, outside the Indian community, including Palestinians, Lebanese, a few Kuwaitis. And my time in the, in the university enabled me also to gain certain insights into Kuwait as a society and a culture. Uh, and I found really what was most remarkable or interesting about Kuwait was that it was a society which had seen a great deal of economic and social change compressed into a very brief period of uh, time. And really the challenge for me as a foreigner, uh, but also as a foreigner who was a diplomat, was understanding what consequences uh, that very rapid change which the oil boom had uh, led to uh, Kuwait undergoing, what were the consequences of uh, that? I found Kuwaitis as a people uh, had many of the characteristics one, which one associates with those who have come to come upon wealth uh, very quickly uh, and largely because of the bounties of uh, Providence. And this, this uh, uh, throws up its own set of challenges for Kuwait as a society. And I remember once this came across to me very vividly when I happened to be outside a Kuwaiti uh, school where grandparents and parents had come to pick up children at the close of uh, school. Uh, and you saw a snapshot of three generations of Kuwaitis. And that uh, really symbolized in many ways its history in the past 50 years. You found the grandparents were Many of them were uh, those who had suffered from debilitating illnesses because of the absence of medical uh, facilities. Their children appeared to be better equipped physically at least, while their grandchildren, the ones who were coming out of the school, you could make out had had all the advantages of modern science, uh, modern medicine, uh, and an upbringing in which there was nothing left to be desired in terms of physical 
satisfactions and physical requirements being fulfilled. Uh, Kuwait was a society, therefore, which had a great deal of social and economic change in a very short period of time. And this influenced very greatly the way Kuwaitis looked at uh, the universe, looked at the world, and especially looked at uh, others. Later, I realized the profound consequences of this uh, worldview which Kuwaitis had. And this happened about a decade later when Kuwait underwent a very traumatic experience following its invasion by uh, Iraq and the outbreak of the first uh, Gulf War. But I found my experience of Kuwait uh, uh, revealing in many ways because it told me certain things about uh, what to expect in a life uh, in diplomacy. Uh, and one of the takeaways of that was that it is very important to understand the, the specific characteristics of different cultures. And I think life as a diplomat serving your country uh, while being outside the country enables you to get a certain perspective of not just how you see the world, but how the rest of the world uh, sees you. Uh, and certainly that is a, there is a big difference between those two perspectives because we view ourselves and we view the world quite differently from the way others view us and the rest of the world views us. And really these two contrasting frames uh, in many ways uh, is uh, central to the entire experience of uh, diplomats. Uh, from Kuwait, I came back to India and after a few years here, I went to another very interesting uh, posting, which was uh, Bhutan, where I spent the next three years. And Bhutan was and remains still a very, very unique uh, example of a, a different ecosystem from what one encounters uh, otherwise in, uh, in South, uh, South Asia. It has a certain isolation, which is uh, on account of its uh, geographical location. But more than that, the Bhutanese have had over, the, over hundreds of years, the experience of being adjacent to two major cultural uh, forces. And these are uh, the Indic civilization, and in many ways, what we can loosely call the Tibetan uh, civilization. And managing their own unique identity and preserving it, uh, notwithstanding its close proximity to these two powerful cultural forces, really to me, uh, comprise the core of uh, Bhutanese identity and Bhutanese uh, personality. Uh, the second reason why I found living in Bhutan so interesting uh, and so fascinating was because it gave me a perspective of it as a part of South Asia and how South Asia views uh, India, which is again, a different experience uh, from and a different perspective from how we see South Asia or how we see our, or how, or how we see our uh, neighbors. Uh, a neighboring country relationship is one of the most challenging in any diplomatic experience. And certainly living in Bhutan for those uh, three years brought that home to me very, very uh, sharply. Uh, Bhutan has a population, it had a population then of about half a million, perhaps a little more than half a million, seven or eight lakhs. It is in that sense, tiny as compared to even the adjoining districts of West Bengal uh, and Assam. So how does a nationality and how does sovereignty emerge out of such small beginnings, especially when it has much larger neighbors like India, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, China, uh, all, uh, all around it. And uh, uh, these, these questions really uh, go into the heart of uh, understanding India's relationships with other countries in, uh, South, uh, in South Asia. Uh, after three years in Bhutan, I found I was uh, uh, sent to a totally different experience uh, which was to the United Kingdom. And uh, the United Kingdom and Bhutan 
uh, uh, are again totally different experiences. Uh, I remember when I landed in London, my children, who were then very young, had never seen a double decker bus uh, before. They had no idea what a large city meant because Thimphu, the capital of Bhutan, had a population when I lived there of less than 10,000. It was a large village by Indian uh, standards. Uh, and from there, you are suddenly transplanted into this world metropolis, uh, which is London, which, uh, uh, and it is a completely different experience because again, uh, when I was in Bhutan, there were two embassies in Bhutan, the Indians and the Bangladeshis. Uh, in, in London at that time, there were perhaps 150 or more foreign uh, missions. Every country has its own different set of issues uh, to deal with, uh, especially because the United Kingdom as a former imperial power uh, had uh, a great depth in its relations with many ex, ex many ex colonies, uh, including uh, India. But my experience in London also gave me, uh, fortunately for me, uh, an insight into uh, living in one of the great cultural capitals of the world. So London's great libraries, its great museums, all of those in many ways were personally very enriching uh, experiences. After three years in London, I came back to India. Uh, and after a stint of about three or four years in the Ministry of External Affairs, I left for my next posting, which was to uh, Pakistan. When I reached Islamabad, I was the acting high commissioner because we did not have uh, uh, ambassadorial level uh, relations. The mission size was very small. And it was in many ways uh, being posted uh, in what was generally regarded to be a hostile uh, terrain. Uh, to my surprise, I found my experience of living in Islamabad and Pakistan quite a contrast to what I had expected uh, so forth. I found in many ways, uh, living in Pakistan gave me a very, very uh, deep insight into the understanding of India, not just as a nation state, but also as a culture. And I think the cultural element of, uh, uh, of an Indian uh, projection or an Indian personality is something which is very important and which we have to keep in mind at all times. I lived in Pakistan for about four and a half years. In that period, India-Pakistan relations went from being very bad to very good. Uh, after four and a half years in Pakistan, I came back to Delhi, then spent uh, some time as High Commissioner in Singapore, uh, while again and then returned again to Pakistan for my final two and a half years as India's High uh, Commissioner. Singapore, in many ways, is a contrast to my first diplomatic experience, uh, which was Kuwait. Here again is a society which has seen a tremendous amount of social and economic change and progress in a short period of time, but. In contrast to Kuwait, where that progress and that social and economic advancement came because of the bounties of nature, in Singapore's case, that advancement came because of the efforts of its people, and more than that, the great passion of its leadership to develop an underdeveloped uh, society. And really, it tells you about how a society can change so very quickly with the right attributes if the right attributes are present in its uh, leadership. But I will say that there are two aspects of a life in diplomacy which have remained with me and which I think are central to the entire diplomatic experience. The first is the need to understand different cultures and to see as to how different cultures uh, develop, what influence they have on how others see you and the rest of the world. The second important point is to understand that there are different points of view and diplomacy as a profession, diplomacy as a career really centers around understanding the importance of appreciating that your point of view is not the only one which exists and there are other points of view which may be different 
from yours. The task of the diplomat is to find bridges between two opposing points of view or often two conflicting points of view. In that sense, it is a very creative uh, career. It's a very creative undertaking and it provides you with the opportunities to educate yourself, not in a narrow sense, but in the widest possible sense of trying to understand other cultures, other civilizations, and other intellectual traditions. Thank you very much.